city of Angkor, Khmer Empire. Two armies clash, clan against clan, a hand-to-hand -hand struggle in the heat and dust. Behind the chaos, the God King rides on his war elephant, supposedly the avatar of Shiva. In reality, he is an ineffectual old man. His six-year reign has been full of insurrections and civil conflict. But in the distance, he sees a figure break off from the Sea of Troops. The man charges toward him, spear in hand. His grandnephew, the boy rebel, only 15. He sprints past the screen of royal guards. The emperor orders his elephant to attack. But as the great beast lowers its tusks to skewer the traitor, the nimble boy vaults in the air and lands on the creature's head. Sprawling backward, the emperor tries to defend himself, but the boy buries his spear in the old man. Thus did Sir Yavaman II, the man who will build Angkor Wat, become emperor of the Khmer. There are two schools of thought about Sir Yavaman II. One is that he was one of the Khmer Empire's greatest leaders, and the other was that he was its greatest propagandist. Most of what we know of Sir Yavaman comes from inscriptions and carvings commissioned by him, which probably contain a certain amount of kindly exaggeration. Because there was also evidence that he was not exactly the godlike general portrayed in inscriptions and temple carvings. He unified the country and re-established relations with Imperial China, but he also launched around six military campaigns against kingdoms in present-day Vietnam, all of which ended in disaster. Of course, we know this from inscriptions by his enemies, so I think it's safe to say, grains of salt all around. But while his reputation as a general is debatable, what's not in question is that he was one of the greatest builders in world history. His signature achievement, Angkor Wat, is so large that in later centuries, people would claim it was built by the gods or through magic. In reality, it took the labor of thousands of stonecutters, sculptors, architects, raft drivers, and elephants 33 years to erect the massive structure. And that's an incredibly short time, considering that in medieval Europe, cities were taking over a century to build their great cathedrals. His reputation as a builder, however, cannot be disconnected from his history as a usurper and a war leader of mixed success. In fact, it's likely Angkor Wat was created as a way to legitimize his rule, a symbol of his worthiness as a god king. We don't know exactly when he started building it, and surprisingly, we don't even know its original name. The Foundation Stila, an inscription tablet stating who built the temple and why, has never been found. In its basic architecture, Angkor Wat resembles other Khmer temples, following the style imported from India. Five mountainous towers representing the five peaks of the mythical Mount Maru, and a moat surrounding it mimicking the mythical Sea of Milk. But just another temple was not enough for Sir Yavaman II. His temple would be on a grand scale. The central tower, built first, would be the tallest building in all of Southeast Asia. In fact, it was so massive that a light porous stone had to be used for its internal structure so the whole thing didn't collapse under its own weight. But it still did. Yeah, it collapsed. The whole thing came down. Because a monument this big created an engineering problem. Due to the monsoon rains, the amount of groundwater at the site changed drastically. When the dry season came, the water table lowered, and the land sunk beneath the heavy tower, destabilizing it. As a solution, it appears the emperor's architects expanded the moat around the site to a whopping 620 feet wide, keeping the water table consistently high so the soil stays hydrated during the dry season. In addition, the force of the water put pressure on the base of the artificial island, supporting the massive constructions there. And actually, rather than describing them as they were built, let's explore the finished temple city through the eyes of a visitor. A foreign visitor, an Indian monk, a man with access to the sacred architecture that ordinary Khmer can only dream about. After a long journey by sea and on foot, he's arrived. The great temple city, the object of his pilgrimage. Or rather, he just sees the gate. A gate larger than some temples. Three towers rear up from a 15-foot carved stone wall. A wall that runs a total of two miles all around the city. He approaches it along the sandstone causeway that bridges the moat passing under a gate large enough to admit elephants. Inside the city proper, he sees 200 acres of structures, most wooden. For an Angkor, all civil buildings, from homes to palaces, were made of wood. He sees the quarters of the priests and the homes of the temple dancers, all along a gridded street plan leading through the housing blocks. And far to the north, beyond the temple mount, he sees the elegantly carved wooden roofs of the palace. 
The only stone structures in the city proper are two shrines, to the north and south, holding holy texts and meant for daily rituals. And then there is the causeway, six steps in the air, a thousand feet long, cutting through the city. Sculptures of the great mythical serpent, the Naga, rise from its balustrades, its many heads flaring like the hood of a cobra. The Naga, symbol of the water that supports this land, is also a symbol of its people. These Khmer are said to be descended from an Indian prince who traveled here and the beautiful serpent princess he wed when he arrived. It's a story that echoes the long-ago joining of Indian religion and Khmer culture. The causeway leads to the great temple mount in the city center. It is, as they said, a whitewashed thing of mythical grace. Five lotus bud towers rise out of the structure, all gilded with gold. At sunrise, their reflections shimmer in a man-made pool, built to create a mirror image of the heavenly temple mount. It grows larger as he approaches it, before he stands at its massive entryway. Now begins the concentric rings of sacredness. Each wall, platform, and gallery will become increasingly restricted as he moves higher and toward the center. But instead of crossing under the great entranceway in the outer wall, the monk decides to walk the outer gallery and see some of the most renowned bas-relief carvings in all of Asia. One depicts the churning of the Sea of Milk, when the gods wrapped a great serpent around a mountain that sprouted from the back of a giant turtle, and pulling on the snake's head and tail, agitating the great sea in order to bring the elixir of immortality to the surface. A masterpiece of a carving, one where you cannot see the joins between the blocks of marble smooth sandstone. The bas-reliefs run counterclockwise, unusual. Since in Hindu temples, it's usually the opposite. The priest wonders if this is because it was intended as a funeral monument for Suryavarman, or because it was dedicated to Suryavarman's principal god, the protector Vishnu, rather than Shiva, the more common patron of Kumar rulers, a question scholars debate to this day. And there, around the next corner, in a long gallery, is Suryavarman himself, carved amid his great army, covered in gold leaf. The Endless Gallery depicts all of the troops of the Empire, his wives, his attendants. A spectacular sight. The monk goes deeper, passing columned galleries painted red, carvings of lotus blossoms on the ceiling picked out in vibrant colors, and statues of gods. And everywhere, the divine women so common to Khmer art. But while some of these simply smile in the Indian fashion, at this great temple, the dancers hold sway. Captured in exquisite movement, their hands lifelike and graceful, these Apsara dancers, divine nymphs released during the churning of the Sea of Milk, capture a vitality unique in the region. He notices that they have individual faces, and wonders if they were modeled on the hundreds of temple dancers that serve the site. He goes deeper still, passing great gates and flooded galleries representing the sacred ocean, heading toward the central tower, though he takes time to climb each of the four smaller towers first. Their steps so steep, he must bend over and ascend them like a ladder, forcing him to reenact the difficulty of climbing to heaven and forcing his gaze downward, so he comes to the divine statues at the top like a supplicant. The priests who are practiced in this can walk up them like normal stairs, an impressive performance setting them apart from the masses who cannot. Finally, he climbs the central tower, the one rumored to hold the ashes of Sir Yavaman himself, for the king is decades dead. And this structure is not exactly what the emperor had envisioned when he was entombed inside it. For when the monk reaches the top, he finds not a statue of Vishnu, but the Buddha. Though Hindu gods are still worshipped, no god is forbidden in this empire. Angkor is now a Buddhist city. Converted by the same man who finished this great monument, by the same man who'd put the final touches on its carvings and replaced its Hindu statues, the man who'd built an even larger city just out of sight beyond the jungle canopy, a man who had rescued Angkor when it was a burned ruin, usurped Sir Yavaman's title as the greatest builder of the Khmer, and forever carved his face on this great metropolis, Jaiwaraman the Seventh. Plot twist. Special thanks to educational tier patrons Ahmed Ziad Turk and Joseph Blaine. 